Jonathan Lee speaking from Jonathan Lee Network um, firm solicitors. We deal with a lot of uh, what people generally term corporate commercial work and particular, particularly small small company mergers and acquisitions work, a, a variety of share and asset deals, management buyouts, private equity deals, etc. And um, we're joined today by uh, Clinton Lee, who uh, many people know within that space in the UK of uh, small company mergers and acquisitions work, who's got a very active online profile um, and specialises in the in the sale and marketing and brokering of of um, of business sales and particularly matching people with the right type of broker. Um, so yeah, Clint, I don't know whether you want to start with just a brief introduction to yourselves, which you, your your business, which you can probably do better than I just attempted just now. Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, hi everyone. Thanks for attending. My name's Clinton Lee. I'm no relation to Jonathan Lee. In fact, I changed the spelling of my surname to ensure there wasn't any confusion. Uh, but I run a business, a consultancy business in the UK. Um, I won't go into a great deal about what I do, but I have an extensive website that gives a lot of information about buying and selling businesses. Um, I don't normally get involved myself in the buying and selling of businesses. My work is generally with advising larger companies. So you're talking about 5 million in turnover and above. Um, I advise them on how to find the right partners uh, to take them to market. Uh, very often they end up with some KBS or somebody they found in Google. Uh, and that's not the best way to get the best price for your business. So they come to me and uh, I give them some in initial free uh, consultation, answer their questions and advise them on how they can find the best party to take their business to market. But basically, between Jonathan and I, we have two of the most visited websites in the UK on this topic. Jonathan's site deals with a lot of legal stuff, you know, your contracts involved in the sale of a business. And mine deals with the other stuff like valuing a business, finding buyers, um, negotiating the deal and things like that. So I'd say if you're interested in the subject, start with those two websites. Uh, there's a lot of material to read. Great. Thank, thanks for the introduction, Clinton. Um, so I can now see that we, we've got a few people who have joined us. Um, I think thanks, Andrea, who's helping with, with this. I think she's admitted a, a few participants now. So there's a few names that I recognize there. Um, Michael Sharp, um, Will Axtell and Ted Leverett. Roberto, uh, we, we've chatted to before. Um, so yeah, I think we've got a 10 or so, maybe a bit more uh, people on, on this call now. If anyone's got any, I mean, we're, it's relatively informal. We're just trying to have a bit of an interesting discussion and, um, uh, and see what comes out of it as a result. So it'd be very useful. <laughs> I think lots of people have interesting questions who, who are on this call. I can see a few more being added now. Um, if you've got <laughs> any questions at all, then please, um, um uh, add those to the zoom i think you i've got um i've got a separate window open here where i get notified of any any questions and then we can um, clinton and myself can deal with those or um i think uh, forgive us because uh, give me anyway because we're, we're a bit new to doing these but i think we can um also just you know instead of reading out your question we can then just unmute whoever's asked the question and get you to um add to and participate in the discussion as it were um between us and uh, we'll see which what works best um so great yeah i think we'll just move on now to to the discussion i've sort of got the the uh, the overview of what we we're going to talk about in front of me um i think we'll particularly talk about our experience or what we've heard about how the current economic situation is impacting on uh, on people who are both looking to buy as well as sell companies at uh, present day. Um, but uh, I think if we just start off with um, Clinton, if that's okay, um, you, you've given before when I've done a talk with you before, a really good overview of the marketing process, sales and marketing process, and, uh, and re you know, regardless of the economic circumstances, sort of the key points that um, people need to get right, particularly if you're a seller when you're, when you're looking to sell or market. And market your your business. Um, I don't know whether you can start off just discussing going over that in a bit of detail, Clinton, and, and then particularly yes, um, um, in yeah. light of today's circumstances. Uh, sure, very briefly. I mean, we won't won't go into a great deal of uh, 
discussion on how to sell a business, but uh, you know, very basically, I would say, if you have a small business, you need to recognize that um, it's not really worth hiring any experts to sell your business for you. There isn't enough meat on the bone to pay uh, a decent business broker or any other professional to do the work that's necessary. And there's a huge amount of work necessary to sell a business. So if you're selling a very small business, a micro business, then my advice would be to do it yourself. Go and spend some time, research the topic, read up as much as you can, buy a few good book, books on how to sell a business uh, and handle the process yourself. If you're a larger business, my advice would be that the number one key factor in determining whether you manage to sell your business, because bear in mind that most businesses going to market don't sell, 80% of them don't sell. So the best, your best chances of uh, actually selling the business and getting a good price are going to revolve around the team you put together. So a good uh, broker or advisor or corporate finance firm or M&A boutique or whoever, somebody to advise you on the deal itself, to find you the buyers, uh, to take you through the process. A good accountant uh, who can advise you on not just the accountancy side of things and valuation, but also in terms of uh, uh, the tax implications, both for you and the company, for various options that you might have available to you. And a good lawyer. Um, Jonathan won't object to this, I'm sure. But you do need a good lawyer for all the paperwork. And there are lots of mistakes you can make if you attempt to do it yourself. So I would uh, strongly rec recommend having a good lawyer. So having that team together, I think that's going to really make the biggest difference uh, to both your uh, probability of sale and the price you're going to get for your business. Great. Um, I, don't, I don't know the level of experience of everyone on the call. I can see some people are, are very experienced in this space, but um, you know, generally you know, the legal process for, um, for, for what it's worth, if, if people are new to this area, um, you know, the lawyers don't tend to get involved until later on um, when there's a, a deal in principle, as it were, and quite often, very often, when there's a, a heads of terms that's been signed and agreed or still, albeit subject to contract. Um, I mean, it's always recommended to get, I think, um, to get some legal input early on, particularly when you're putting together and negotiating the heads of terms, because sometimes it can be a little too late for a, a lawyer to then have the heads of terms put in front of them to then scope out and quote for, for the ongoing legal work to formalize and complete, complete the deal. Um, and there might be some, some points that present some difficulties in those heads of terms, which could otherwise have been structured differently, or you know, somebody would have benefited, whether the buyer or seller, from some advice at that stage. Um, and you know, even though they're subject to contract, they, um, they can be sort of uh, people call sort of morally quite binding so people are reluctant to to deviate from those heads of terms once actually once you've got that concrete in writing as it were um so anyway we're, heads of terms agree whether whether law, lawyers are involved or not at that stage um and then you know commonly as, as clinton said if it's a really small business and we we see loads of things where people have attempted to or successfully manage to to sell and deal with the legal process um, themselves uh, as a, as both the seller and the buyer um, and we've got a lot of resources on our, our website um, including paid downloads so you can download a relevant um, pay a, a few pounds to download a relevant for example asset purchase heads of terms template and due diligence questionnaire what have you um, but then invariably we often even with the really small things we see people come across difficulties and then that's where they might um, they've tried to do things themselves and they might come to us and then there's invariably more more involved than people might expect uh, or think at the beginning and um, a few issues to sort out and um, people we, we find that business owners they're not used to sometimes being challenged they've run their own um, thinking in particularly of sellers who've uh, you know for years um, maybe run their own business and got their own way what, what have you and they 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 find quite often the the process of dealing with a buyer who's got very different expectations to them even when they've got the heads of terms agreed um there's sort of a, a clash there whereby yeah the buyer sees things in a different way and wants different different terms and the, and the seller will um even when we're telling the seller that there's nothing really to to be too concerned about here and you know these are the only really points you need to focus on um, they might might start to get a, a little bit um agitated about something so i think 
that's one area where having an experienced advisor, a lawyer can help is, um, you know, it, it can tell you what's material and what's, what's worth um, negotiating on and what, what isn't and, and hold your hand through the process so that you don't come unstuck unnecessarily. So yeah, the, the, the main document, whether it's a share or asset deal, is a share purchase agreement or asset purchase agreement. Uh, depending on the deal and what's involved, various ancillary documents as well. The main one being the disclosure letter, which uh, is produced vis-a-vis um, -vis against the warranties that in the asset purchase or share purchase agreement. Um, and that's whereby, that's kind of a process whereby first and foremost, it gives comfort to the buyer that he knows that um, against those warranties, which are contractual statements of fact, that the um, that the seller is has a contractual process whereby, whereby they're forced to disclose all material facts, so the buyer knows that they've got all information at their at their hand in their hands within that disclosure letter in particular. And if it hasn't been disclosed against those warranties, then that leaves the um, uh, buyer open to have a, a possible warranty warranty claim. So that it kind of like facilitates um, the deal moving on to completion and and, and uh, enables an extra level of transparency in a way um, and and then you know every deal is different various issues involve um, once the once the final form share purchase agreement or asset purchase agreement is is agreed there may be property involved as well to, to deal with and landlords and respective leases um, but broadly once that main document contractual document is agreed that's signed um, signed by the parties uh, exchanged uh, and then the completion funds um, can transfer um, across often often with the use of the solicitor's uh, client account to give added security, although um, that's not needed. And, and sometimes for really small things, we, we keep out of it uh, in terms of handling completion funds, albeit we have a, a client account for when that's needed for the, the larger the larger deals. Um, so yeah, sorry if that's sort of somewhat to people suck eggs, um, but um, Again, I'm not aware of everyone's circumstances on, on the call, but that's a general overview of how solicitors uh, are involved in the process very, very sort of briefly, although that sort of droned on a bit. Um, so, yeah, next point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so are you there, Clinton? I was just going to yeah, ask I'm you about... I'm still here, yes, yes. Uh, so, yes, <laughs> so we can move on to the, to the main topic, buying yeah. and selling in this kind of environment. Yeah, so just getting you want to see, get your view of the impact of the lockdown, how you've seen it, the in your experience as well, and the people you've been speaking to online, offline about the impact of the, the lockdown period and this sort of ongoing, I don't know what to call it now, sort of coronavirus, COVID nineteen situation, as it were. I don't know. Yeah, nice. where yeah. Um, yeah, government's gone a bit crazy, and um, you know, businesses are, are not not confident about the future. Um, and you know they've been restricted from what they can and can't do, etc. Yeah, I think before we go into the actual um, impact this has had on buyers and sellers, I think we need to touch briefly on what the overall situation is. A lot has been written about buying and selling a business in a recession, but this isn't a normal recession. I know they say that of every recession, but this is isn't this really isn't a normal recession because. There are some factors here that we haven't seen before in peacetime Britain. Number one, there are three factors really, three main factors. Number one, the amount of money sloshing about, huge amounts of money sloshing about. There was a lot of money in the market even before COVID-19. Um, private equity houses were sitting on, I think, was it a trillion dollars worth of capital uh, looking mm -hmm. for deployment? So there was a lot of money there waiting to be invested. And that's before coronavirus hit us. And then the mm -hmm. governments have opened the taps. I mean, they've opened the taps like at no time they've ever done before. Hundreds of billions. You know, the European Union has just agreed a massive plan as well. The money all over the place. And we're talking money being spread all the way from small businesses, your bounce back loan, to larger business, businesses, your C-bills, your coronavirus business interruption loan scheme. Then you move up a bit to my typical client. They get the coronavirus. Um, large business interruption loan scheme and then you move up further you've got the corporate funding facility where the government's buying paper you know even if you've never sold paper before all you do is print out some paper and they'll give you large chunks of money millions of pounds uh, mm. to just to pump it into the economy so there's a huge amount of money that's number one 
and of course there are very few investment opportunities as well you've got to bear that in mind so that's the kind of uh, financial uh, setup number one mm. number two there's been a huge impact on how people work a lot more working from home and this has affected public transport trains buses i mean there are no bus companies have sold uh, a lot of their fleet uh, there are uh, airline companies that have sold lufthansa has sold all their a380s and i think uh, was it uh, British Airways who put up their 747s for sale, uh, getting rid of the whole fleet of 747s. But anyway, there's a lot of a lot of that going on. So a lot of companies are restructuring because of this uh, huge move towards working mm. from home. And of course, online services like Zoom um, are doing very well. I don't know if you've seen Zoom share price. You know, over the last six months, it's just been shooting up. It's one straight upward slope. Mm. Um, you've got people who are selling online, e-commerce sellers. They're doing fantastically well. So. This has all made a, you know, change how we operate, change the kind of um, environment, what businesses are likely to be successful, what businesses are likely to, to not uh, be successful, to struggle in this kind of an environment. And of course, mm -hmm. the, the fabric of our society has changed, I think. Now, we've got a lot of older people who have sadly passed away. Um, mm -hmm. The virus has disproportionately affected older people. So of yeah. course, yeah. the need for care homes now has drastically reduced a huge drop in care homes. So I can see a lot of consolidation happening in that sector over the next yeah. few months and years. Yeah. But similarly, hospitality has been affected. Um, you have had uh, uh, entertainment affected. Uh, you've had yeah. a lot of other businesses that are just not going to be the same again yeah. because of social distancing or because of people not wanting to congregate in large groups. Mm. Uh, you're going to have a lot of businesses that are just not going to be viable anymore. So. Mm. The whole structure, I think, the structure of society changing uh, is something that's going to require some some careful thought. Businesses need to analyze how this is going to impact uh, their operations going forward. Yeah, so that's the back. What do you what do you see? You know, as the background. Um, yes, uh, just sort of picking up on sort of uh, in practice what we what we see and sort of um, people we speak to. Um, uh, interesting, you mentioned care homes. I don't know whether it's just us or whether this general trend, but we see, we've had a lot of interest of people wanting to um, acquire and consolidate UK care home businesses, mm -hmm. particularly from mm -hmm. overseas. Um, they see that as an opportunity at the moment. Um, we, we haven't advised on one of those deals presently, but we sort of early stages talking, talking to people um, about that. Um, yeah, of course, the, the, the trend on people working from home and things being done virtually more and more I mean it's great for our business um, you know we don't have an office in London that's kind of how we work and and now not having to have meetings as often and to do zoom zoom calls is brilliant um, we've got our own e-commerce shop which has been quite we've run for almost a year now and it's been quite interesting just following the the downloads on that seeing the peaks and trusts and um, you know particularly at the beginning of the lockdown period even though um, you know, we're offering downloadable template products, as it were, you know, there was still the, the volume of those downloads seems to sort of follow people's confidence in the economy. So, for example, the beginning of the lockdown period, the numbers suddenly shot down and there wasn't really much activity on our website. Whereas yeah, yeah I saw things, that as well. It flattened out, didn't it? it just yeah. Dropped. And after two months, I guess, our, things seem to be more, people get more confident. And then, um, we, we saw a, a much greater volume, for example, last month of people um, downloading um, template legal products, which I guess ultimately reflects ac you know, business activity because they're all re yeah. relating to people doing transactions or whatever it might be. Weirdly, the last few days, we've, it's all been a bit quiet, quieter than for, for several weeks. So I, I don't know whether that's just us or whether that's a large um, trend. But um, yeah, in terms of the businesses we've, we've been advising on, for example, one. Um, you know, we were instructed right at the beginning of the year with a, a really popular, well-run um, cafe business in, in London, in a nice posh suburb of um, or borough of London. And um, the person, the, the owner, was uh, wanted to emigrate, go back to New Zealand. Um, but yeah, we thought that would be, you know, like most of these things, over in one or two months, maybe, or two months, because there's the got to deal with the landlord and the lease, etc. Um, but they yeah, that's still been dragging on <laughs> right, right till till now. And the the buyers, are, it's a very good buyer. Um, they've got fantastic experience in in that sector. They own a number of restaurants and cafes already in London. Very much interested in the deal. They don't want to pull out at all. Um, but they still. Um, 
yeah, they're, they're very, being very, very slow with their due diligence process because as, as they confirm themselves, they, they can't have confidence, even though they've got money and they, can, they want to complete the acquisition, they don't have a, a, enough sort of confidence in, in the economy in you know the medium to long term i guess into how it's going to impact on those type of businesses will you know will people to continue to eat out and go to cafes and, and gather so as how, much as they did before so how are you building any um, assurance any confidence for these buyers how are you maybe restructuring the deal to give them some comfort um yeah i guess sort of the main commercials of that deal it hasn't changed i mean the the buyer themselves they keep saying you know look we're fine with uh, with it as it is and i think you know the even though the seller wants to wants to go back to new zealand um uh, at the same time they've got a, a good business and i think you know if, if the the buyer did materially uh try and change the terms of the deal i think they just sort of sort of think okay it's not not worth it let's hold on for longer we'll just have to sort of you know run it for another year two years see so, how yeah, things so pan out do you think it's a good idea for those businesses that have been affected by coronavirus, as long as it's a temporary effect uh, and they're going to then return to normal, do you think they should just pause, you know, not go to market now, wait till uh, things have settled down a bit before listing their business for sale? Um, possibly, yeah. I guess it's what, what, what are the reasons for sale? I mean, that's sort of similar to another situation we advised on recently where it's a recruitment business or businesses, recruitment group, which has mm. been very very successful in the past but i imagine like majority of recruitment businesses they've just been completely dead uh, um, or very quiet the last few months um and they had to, to furlough staff and all the rest of it mm. um but they this they made a couple of acquisitions of recruitment businesses mm. um which we assisted with very fast turnarounds that they were not much money was being paid for them but um, um that was something we dealt with in a two I, three yeah, weeks I, last month um, but their their expectation is okay. Now is a good opportunity to buy um, for whatever reason the sellers wanted to um, sell, and they were part of the consideration was shares in the acquiring company or their group or the holding company. Um, so obviously that um, helped yeah, facilitate I, the, the sale. Yeah, I have some some stats. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but I have bots that go and crawl all the business for sale websites your Dalton's businesses, oh, okay. for um, that's right, right biz, all of them. And I collect data on a regular basis, ongoing basis, and I put it in a big database, I analyze it, and I know what's happening in the market. Um, I've seen a drop of 30%, over 30% uh, in the number of businesses being listed. So oh, I looked wow. at, uh, yeah, I looked at June, uh, this is a bit behind, uh, you know, I haven't analyzed July yet, but in June, uh, compared with last year, there was an over, 30% reduction in the number of businesses being listed. Now, mm. um, I can see that there's a lot of inquiry. Uh, I'm getting a lot of inquiries coming in. I'm getting a lot of people on my website. I'm getting more traffic now than I get in January. And January is normally the busiest month. So I'm getting a lot of traffic, a lot of inquiries coming in, but people are not actually going to market because there seems to be this uh, belief in, uh, in, uh, among business owners that if you go to market now, it's a uh, bad, yeah time, you may not get a good price and uh, it might be worth if you're not in a hurry to sell if you're not distressed it might be worth holding on for a bit and going to market a bit later now yeah. on the business buyer side i'm finding a lot of activity a lot of business buyers around they're getting very excited and there are two types of business buyers the ones who are looking for distressed businesses and of course for them this is a wet dream you know you've got so many distressed businesses around mm -hmm. um, and yeah they are they're going crazy, you know, making inquiries, uh, trying to do deals, usually without any um, upfront payment being involved, things like that. Mm. But on the other side, the, the, the good businesses, the businesses that have done well through this uh, lockdown, and there are lots mm. of businesses that have done really well. Yeah. Those businesses, they're actually asking for more money. In fact, today I posted uh, in LinkedIn mm. about one example where someone has managed to get 80,000 pounds more for their business than yeah. the price that they negotiated just before the lockdown. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, Purely I mean, we, because we, of how they performed. Yeah, I mean, that, it, it's similar in some ways. I think that we do a lot of startup work with startups um, raising money and in investment rounds, uh, and that seems to have, I think, it seems to have dropped off to to some degree, but that seems to still been very active, and we've advised on some of the the biggest deals that we've been involved been involved with to date. Um, 
to date recently. Um, and one was a sustainable packaging company that's still only two and a half years old, but raised um, 10 million pounds recently that we assisted in. So there's, as you say, there's a lot of money around and people looking to commit it in the right companies. Uh, and I, I guess their model is attractive because it's um, of the now, as it were, sustainable packaging. Um, they're doing a lot of PPE uh, work for essential workers and producing lo lots of that. So, albeit they've got to be careful to not overcommit on that area because you know maybe this can be come and gone, and you know it's not. You have um, a vaccine it, and everything gets back to normal. You know, yeah, that's uh, well, possible as well, isn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so, but you know, it's just an aspect of their business. What a question sort of from Mike and Sharp. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, I think that's that's all I was going to say on that point, really. But um, yeah, so you've, you've got a question. Yes, Come Michael. On, Michael was asking about the government fiscal incentivizations for investing I, in a business. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. That's good that you've got the questions. They don't seem to have come in to me, but maybe I'm doing something wrong. Was yeah. So it's about government incentives for investing. Uh, and okay. uh, do you do you think this is on the horizon in the next six to twelve months? Um. I, I think oh, is this sort of more for me, sort of startups and uh, yeah, SCIS and EIS. Um, I mean, there's been well, a lot. You of... had the future fund, didn't you? Two hundred fifty million, wasn't it? The future fund. Yeah, so that that keep that still. Um, yeah, they keep they've extended that, and that's going on till September now. So there's there's more money than there was originally, and a lot of startups are keen to get their hands on that. Um, uh, we've got a client at the moment who's raising. Um, uh, a 1.2 million pound investment round. Um, uh, it's a sort of publishing, online publishing business. Um, and as part of that, they're, they're going to get some, some match funding from the, um, from, from the government, from that, uh, the convertible loan that you get, get from mm. the government, albeit it comes to, uh, yeah, the future fund. So we're doing the future fund application as, as part of that investment round. So yeah, again, there's, there's money there and they, they've extended, the, the qualifying criteria, the companies who can, who can get that, um, and it seems to be ongoing for, for, yeah. for the moment. Um, yeah, they keep they keep changing even with the uh, the corporate funding facility. They keep making it easier and easier. You know, initially you needed to have a certain credit rating for, from one of the top credit rating agencies, and then yeah. they reduced the rating. And then they said, you, if you don't have a rating from one of those top agencies, you can go get it from somewhere else. Seriously, yeah. you go and get it from some other credit rating agency, and we'll still give you the loan. So I think in answer to Michael's question, I think um, that um, the government won't want to invest directly. Uh, they've been burnt with the credit crunch investments. Yeah. Uh, they won't. Uh, uh, I, I can't see them. Doing well, the that. weird, weird course, thing the, is, um, yeah. So you were going to, you, you were going to say. The Siebel's, the, the, they're, they're doing it indirectly, aren't they? They're giving yeah. the Siebel's money out. They're giving out money to large businesses. Uh, they, yeah. I mean, the, the thing I was going to add before, before we talk about uh, C bills or you talk about C bills, the thing I was going to add, particularly startups, is, um, you know, it just seems the obvious thing is like SEIS and EIS actually just to, to increase um, the thresholds for that and make it easier because, there's, you know, regardless of um, present economic circumstances, there's so much money um, you know, caught up in, in individuals and yeah. people. And, uh, and if you, um, and there is still opportunity, obviously continuous opportunities of, of companies, early stage companies um, and, and, think, and companies that have been around for a while when you're thinking about EIS as well, that, um, that, that money is looking for a home for it, as it were. But the, even about, there's, there's been lobbying on, the, on behalf of the organization, SEIS, SEIS, um, um, organizations, before, um, government hasn't done anything about that yet. Yes, yeah, sir. Before we go to the question from Will, um, I was going to ask you, do you see any other encouragement, any other incentives for investing in businesses? Because, I mean, this is what they want to do. They want to kickstart the economy. They're keen for people to invest. They're keen for people to start businesses. And, of course, the EIS uh, and the, uh, the CIS um, uh, liberalization Absolutely. if they make it easier you know that would help but what about established businesses can you see any uh, changes coming into play to make it easier to acquire established businesses um well not yeah not not that i can i'm uh, aware of at the top of my head other other than you know aware the last few weeks that um which i wasn't originally about c bills and how um you know the terms of that depending on the lender um, it is. It is. It seems to be designed to an extent for um, companies or big companies who can actually access those funds to use it to acquire um, businesses as a, an asset. 
Mm -hmm. um, but ourselves in our practice, we haven't had an example come across that, come across Michael, that yet. Mike, Michael also asks about um, green and sustainable companies uh, and existing schemes. Uh, personally, I don't think that that's going to happen. I think that uh, the environment is going to take a bit of a backseat, as it has in Europe. Uh, that's going to probably happen here as well. And they'd use the pretext of uh, unusual circumstances, desperate situation. We need to focus on uh, getting the economy running again. And I think, unfortunately, I think that uh, some green policies are going to uh, suffer as a result of this uh, the current uh, move towards getting the economy going again. Mm. Yeah, sort of less of a focus of the the government. Um, yeah, Greta Thunberg or, or whatever her her name was from Sweden seems to have gone completely off the radar. And, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, Will asks, Will uh, Axtel asks about potential changes to CGT. How will that impact um, the appetite to sell? Now, of yeah, course, that's uh, a good for point. the other for the other yeah for the other uh, uh, attendees, um, so most of them would be aware that. Uh, the government recently changed the lifetime allowance for entrepreneurs relief and they reduced mm. it uh, from 10 million to 1 million. So now you pay at the 10% entrepreneurs relief rate of 10% on the first million when you sell your business. But yeah. above that, you pay your normal CGT rates. Uh, yeah. So what do you see in terms of potential changes to CGT? Do you see any on the horizon? Uh, I hope not. Um, I think, yeah, my, I saw Michael Sharp who asked the questions earlier, I saw he share, set, shared something on uh, LinkedIn yesterday about uh, from the FT, where it seems to be a very, I mean, not capital gains tax related, but from... Um, yeah, there is a, a difference, but there's a lot of speculation out there about what possible changes could come in. Yeah, so it seems like, it seems generally, we don't quite know what's going to happen yet, but from what we, from, for example, like the article that Michael shared and then from other sort of authoritative sources, there seems to be a real appetite to uh, increase capital gains tax and you know inheritance tax and all the rest of it so i think it's sort of early days now but i think maybe later on in the year there could be sort of bad news in the next budget as it were but um, i mean generally like the, when you know when, when relatively recently the entrepreneurs really threshold changed um mm. yeah i think it just sort of sets the wrong tone really just speaking to entrepreneurs yeah. and business owners who are invariably all our clients it's um I just have noticed sort of a sense of deflation, kind of like not that they're necessarily thinking many of them are, of selling their business, but it's more something you know. The way government in, sort of pulled the, the rug term. out from under them, didn't they? The, the government pulled the rug out from under them. They've been planning on this uh, uh, availing of the ER, and then suddenly it was uh, withdrawn. But given that this big change happened only recently, personally, I don't see any major change to CGT coming up. Um, mm. There may be a wealth tax. Of, not, of, not in respect of business sales, then, is that? Not, not in respect saying? of business sales, I don't think. Yeah, no. yeah that's probably true. I mean, I, I've seen them talk about CGT in, in respect of property sales. Um, yeah, I mean, who knows what's going to materialize, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, we've got a, 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 I guess we sort of move through the questions, really. I've got, um, you, you see the one from Graham there? Clint? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you, you tackle that first and then so, I'll come. Yeah, so Graham's question, uh, private equity investors have traditionally placed a lot of emphasis on meeting, yeah, meeting management teams in person they are backing. In the current situation with face-to-face -face meetings and international travel restricted, do you expect those investors to be as willing to do deals relying on just Zoom, et cetera? Um, yeah, I think I'll sort of go initially on that because I guess we've, um, you know, we're a young, fast growing or we were fast growing law firm. We've sort of, um, I think we've still grown this year despite the lockdown, but um, things have sort of plateaued out a bit. But um, yeah, a lot of our work, it's only the, the really biggest deals where we have to go, for example, to London to meet a new client um, for the face to face meeting once or twice before we then, then get instructed. Um, but we, we've we continuously been busy through the lockdown period, uh, including with, I guess a lot of the work comes from existing contacts and clients where they know us already, but quite often we've never actually met those people in person at all, but maybe we've started off with smaller things and we've kind of grown and the relationships developed as well. But Zoom, we've found Zoom really good for introductory calls with, with clients where we wouldn't have had that uh, video face-to-face -face opportunity before we might have just had a phone call um and and won the work whereas now with a video that just adds, adds an extra element um but i have also come across examples of like for example there's a uh, you know anything anything bigger of a material 
substantial size, then I think people want to be able to travel. They want to meet in person. Things might change, but for the moment, people have got um, things that come, I've come across anyway. They've got their plans on hold before they can, uh, they're waiting to travel to London to have meetings with people. So, for example, we've got a contact of ours has put us in, in touch with an in Indian, obviously very wealthy Indian guy based in India who wants to buy a 10 million pound residential property in London um, very keen to go ahead all the rest of it but doesn't want to progress with it unless he can travel to and, and meet people in London first uh, otherwise that's all on hold um, another another thing would be you know, Qatari investors we came across which fantastic we had a good call we've had emails going back and forth but again they don't want to um, progress with, with their plans until they can travel to they feel comfortable in traveling to London and and having meetings with people so that's just in our experience I imagine you know that will continue to be the case if this goes on any longer and if there are continue continue continuously uh, continuous travel restrictions then you know maybe people the longer this goes on they'll just give up and think okay well let's just go ahead and you know having zoom calls with people that's as good as it's gonna that's as good as it's gonna get and and we're comfortable to proceed on that basis do the aml id checks and all the rest of it um but i think in our own experience that's where i think like perhaps yourself Vincent, and having a very good web presence um helps because in our discussions with new clients who get in touch with us um that's you know they they go a lot on what they read online about us or not necessarily about us, what we've written and the content we've published. If they find that really useful, insightful, and it shows our kind of practical experience um, and maybe one or two other people have recommended us, then um, that we find that's, that leads to us converting that lead into a, into a client on the basis of a, of a good phone call or, or even now um, Zoom, Zoom video call. So... Yeah, that's our experience. I don't know. I don't know about yourself, Clinton. Whether well, I, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't deal with the pri private equity houses myself because I'm not actually selling businesses. Um, I deal with a lot of corporate finance firms. I speak to a lot of uh, M&A uh, advisory firms, investment banks. These are the people I speak with in my uh, my daily work because I'm trying to find the right partner for a business that's going to sell. Uh, so my client is typically a large business, maybe 10 million or 20 million in turnover. And uh, I'm shopping around looking for, for the right partner. For them. So I speak with the corporate finance firms and the, the brokers. Um, and I haven't had a great deal of feedback on this as to you know, how, how foreign investors are finding the restrictions uh, on travel impacting on the transactions. Um, but I would expect, of course, that uh, those who want to do the tire kicking actually visit the factory, uh, walk around, have a look at the premises, uh, have a look at uh, the stock. Uh, the inventory or the machinery or whatever else if they want to actually come and physically check that and they're restricted from doing it because their country doesn't allow travel then of course those transactions are going to be affected um, but i think i would expect that those account for a small minority of transactions hmm. okay um interesting um yeah what, what should we where should we move on to now um what should maybe what what should buyers do? What should sellers do differently in this situation? Uh, do you think? Yeah, so I was going to mention. Um, so I think obviously people are looking very much focused on maybe different types of companies and businesses that are structured to to cope with this ongoing lock, lockdown or coronavirus or social distancing, whatever you want to call it um circumstances um if you're a buyer you're looking for um you know a company that can easily uh, operate on a virtual basis uh if there are going to be problems with staff employees working in the central um in the same physical space um as well as generally if it, if it can generally operate online and, and e-commerce functionality fantastic more and more moving to um on, online um, trades as it were um, of course sort of Amazon being the prime example during this period and then the supermarkets generally as well these are sort of the, the only businesses that have been able to sort of operate 
uh, generally throughout the period. And they're, particularly the supermarkets, they must have seen their, their online sales sort of significantly increase. Um, particularly in my village, I just see all the delivery vans constantly um, buzzing around. Um, so, and, and, and generally for, we advise a lot of startups, um, a lot of them are pre-revenue or not necessarily pre-revenue, but they're, they're, they're still focused on uh, raising money and developing their product rather than generating cash flows as such, even if they're doing that. But I mean, those are the, um, you know, those are the, the, the businesses that are, that are attracting the funding are, are, are technology, invariably technology startups and, and um, companies or startups that we, until lockdown period, did a lot of work for and that were ra raising decent amounts, uh, anything to do with like the entertainment, leisure space, outdoor activities, what have you, um, experiences, um, even albeit, you know, there, there was a, a, a significant web presence, those, those um, companies have re really suffered and they've just gone completely quiet. So, um, uh, and that their plans are put on hold and they're not raising any subsequent in investment for the, for the moment anyway. Um, and, but as far as we can see the, you know, techno your typical technology startup software focus, based um, continues to um, to do well in terms of attracting yeah. capital okay. and, and generating revenue? Well, in my view, um, business buyers can do something differently. Uh, they've got to appreciate that uh, at the moment, you've got distressed businesses and you've got businesses that are doing really well. So if you're looking for distressed businesses, I think the, the traditional locations are not very good anymore. So your online portals, your marketplaces like uh, Dalton's, uh, they aren't doing that well. A lot of these distressed businesses are not uh, going on there, not getting listed because they are in a hurry to sell. So I think if you're looking for a distressed business, uh, make some friends with IPs, with some uh, insolvency practitioners. Um, mm. You make your London Gazette, your morning reading, breakfast reading. Mm. Uh, these are the kinds of things you need to do, but uh, you won't find a lot of these businesses coming up for sale, getting listed uh, on mm. marketplaces. I think there's less of that happening at this point in time. If you're looking for a good, solid, um, profitable business and one that's not in distress, then you've got to appreciate that there's a lot of competition out there. There are very few of these businesses coming online, uh, coming up, coming to market. And there are a lot of buyers chasing them. Uh, and mm -hmm. this is what I'm finding from speaking with corporate finance firms. Uh, few of these businesses coming online, they, because they're doing well, they're thinking, okay, we'll, we'll uh, not go to market now. We'll ride this wave out. Um, when things return to normal, then we'll go to market and we'll get a better price. That seems to be the thinking. So yeah. a lot more competition for the good businesses. And uh, you need to be at the top of your game if you want to, uh, to land uh, a good target. You've got to first have your funding in place. And none of this nonsense of I could possibly raise the money if we do the right deal nonsense. Mm. Uh, have your funding in place. If you don't have the, the cash already, then go and you know, remortgage your house or sell your car. Um, or see if you can find someone to buy your mother-in-law, whatever. Just raise the money, get the money there, have evidence of it, and then approach these companies. Bear in mind, if they're really, really busy now, they don't want to talk. Um, mm -hmm. So you'll find that you're getting a lower response rate to the emails or letters that you send out. So if you're buying a list of companies in a particular sector, um, you will find that you're getting a lower response rate. So I would say come up with, um, different ways come up with innovative ways of finding uh, new businesses finding your targets uh, maybe hire somebody to do your deal sourcing for you because origination mm. is it's a tricky business at the best of times mm. um, and this is maybe one of those times where you would benefit from having an expert work for you but you can come up with unusual ideas you know when i was buying businesses uh, this was a long time ago online businesses in say about 2005 i created bots to go and collect data from all the marketplaces and I had automatic analyzing of that data so that I could only you know, look at a key number of businesses per week, maybe 10 businesses per week, uh, and look at them in detail and drop all the others, all the useless businesses. Uh, mm -hmm. So that sort of that automation sort of made it uh, a lot, lot easier for me. There was nobody else doing it at that time. And it made it a lot, lot easier for me to find targets. So whatever it is, you know, you're doing, think, think out of the box, come up with some unusual ideas. Um, maybe talk to me or talk to somebody else who's, who's done it in the past or hire uh, someone to do it for you. So that's my advice for buyers. 
Yeah, I was just wondering, Clinton, of all the sort of inquiries you get and people you come across your way in the last sort of few months, what has there been like a typical type of buyer you've seen? Um, or, or they just been a whole mix Unfortunately, of and circumstances? Yeah, this is something I rant about on LinkedIn quite a lot. 90% of the buyers out there are people who don't actually have the money. <laughs> they pose mm. as funded. They might have a fancy sounding company name, but yeah. it's a brand new company that's just regi been registered. Um, they have not made any acquisitions before. They have no experience, but they've attended a course on how to buy a business. <laughs> yeah. And now they fancy themselves as, as yeah. business owners. But you also have fresh MBAs coming out of uh, university who've been mm -hmm. sold this whole entrepreneurship through acquisition dream. Okay. Uh, so you can become a CEO from day one. You know, the, the day you graduate, you can go and become a CEO and you can own your own company. Mm. So they're doing the same thing. They're calling themselves search funds and they're going hunting for businesses, but they don't actually have the money behind them. Uh, their mm. logic is once we find a good business, then we can get investors to put the money up for that acquisition. So they yeah. have investors. They've spoken with some investors. They've spoken with finance companies and all of them have been assured. Yes, if you find a good deal, we'll give you yeah. the money. But they don't have the money themselves. And of course, those are very, very tricky deals. Because mm. you're dealing with somebody who doesn't have the money, who's reliant on a third party. Yeah. Very messy and they tend not to get to completion. So, yeah, I have, I've come across one of those before. Yeah. Pardon? I, I was just remembering coming across one of those before and then. Um, I tell you what, uh, brokers are the, being inundated with them. Um, okay. And I've actually put a, a, a booklet together for brokers mm. to advise them on how they can weed these characters out right from the start and not actually deal with that because it is a waste of time. It's a waste of time for the brokers. It's a waste of time. Yeah. For the, the seller was very reluctant or instantly sort of worked out what was going on and just, you know, rightly. Yeah. So I, I advise sellers, I advise sellers have no embarrassment about demanding proof of funds. Hmm. Ask for yeah. liquid funds, not some uh, airy fairy letter from a credit company saying that funds will be made available if um, the price is right, etc but actual cash in the bank, get a letter from their solicitor or a letter from their accountant saying that they've got cash sitting in the bank, ready for deployment, ready to make an acquisition. Yeah. Um, okay. But also that's... check them out. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, that sort of maybe links sort of on to, I think we've got another question. From the last year, we've got John 10 minutes. Graves. So yeah, I think if anyone's got, um, yeah, we'll maybe wrap up after this question, but if anyone's got anything else that they want to, um, they think that we'd like to answer. If you could submit that, that would be great. Otherwise, I'm conscious of eating up too much time and it's sort of lunch time, etc. But yeah, John, John Graves says, um, I'd be interested to understand where you feel buyers need to be in, in the split between upfront and some sort of deferred payment mechanism. Having, um, having cash upfront is fine, but what are you seeing in terms of the upfront to future payments and what, uh, how the, the balance is split between that? Um, Clinton, have you got any thoughts? Yeah, on that? absolutely. Um, recently? In, in the distressed business, in the dis distressed market, you are going to be looking at deals where you don't need a great deal of cash. Uh, you mm -hmm. might even pick up a business for no cash investment whatsoever. You just make some promises to look after the business, look after the staff, and you might get the ven vendor just saying, okay, listen, take it over, give me my freedom, I'll walk away. Yeah. Uh, but as you move up to better and better businesses, you will find, especially given that there's so much of competition out there, you will find that the price they're demanding as a multiple of their earnings is higher, but also they're more demanding in terms of cash up front. Mm. Now, I spoke to a, a family office yesterday, a Canadian family office, a company called Valsoft, and they, they've made an acquisition recently in Belgium, and they're looking very actively for acquisitions in the UK. And mm. I spoke to them about the, the kind of uh, proportions. And... You know what, like with other private, uh, uh, private equity firms and family offices, they're quite happy to pay 70%, 80% in cash for a good business. Okay. So yeah. if you're a buyer and you're looking out there for a good business, this is the kind of competition you have. Um, also bear in mind that strategic buyers, people who are already in the trade, maybe larger mm -hmm. businesses uh, who are looking to acquire and expand through acquisition, they've got a lot of cash. They're sitting on Siebel's money. They're sitting on... Uh, you know, coronavirus, large business, mm. it's a lot of money. So they can afford to pay higher cash for, uh, upfront payments. So if mm. you've got the cash, then I would say use that to your advantage to negotiate a lower price. Mm. If you don't have the cash and you, you're forced to pay a smaller proportion 
of mm. the, the total price in cash and you're, you're, you need to rely on a lot of deferred payment, then expect to hey, pay a higher price basically. You know, make, yeah. make a better yeah. offer, make a higher offer and make it less contingent on the performance of the business. Don't tie it yeah. to an earnout. Yeah. Um, yeah. Make, an, make a higher offer and then that's the way you could perhaps get over the issue of having uh, yeah. lower capital at your disposal than some of these other yeah. competitors of yours. Yeah, just I guess adding to that, just going on, on our own experience recently, last month, um, our last two deals that completed was um, acquisition of a software company. So I guess sort of a resilient business model, um, and uh, and also um, acting for uh, the buyer on the acquisition of two recruitment businesses. But um, in both cases, there I think the 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 completion payment was about between the top of my head 30 to 50 percent of the total purchase price and um, on both of those deals the, the balance of the payments was split out over a two-year two-year period with monthly monthly payments equal monthly payments being due each month so you know that's outstanding as a, as a loan as it were um i think i can't remember where i think yeah one of them involved a personal guarantee um, for those outstanding payments um, but in both cases, there was kind of an exist, somewhat of an existing relationship between the buyer and sellers. So maybe in those situations, there was a bit more trust and more of an established relationship. Hence, uh, yeah, I suppose in your average of, management buyout, you'd see that, wouldn't you? You see a lower cash component in a management buyout, for example. Yeah, that's true. So maybe that's sort of similar because there's that established relationship, as it were. And yeah, where we've been involved in management buyouts, then yeah, there's the the security uh, uh, arrangements as well and uh, i guess the 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 pe person who's selling has confidence in the team um, that are, that are taking on the business or the business itself i guess um yeah okay um well i think maybe maybe we we should wrap up there i think that's probably as good a point as any i don't know if there's any any last words you want to say clinton um, i think well good luck to to all the sellers and buyers out there um, yeah. I don't uh, particularly promote my services. I don't do any marketing. And as you know, I've not even asked you for the list of names of attendees today. Um, mm -hmm. So I just tell people, if you're looking to buy a business or sell a business, start by doing your research online and you will end up on my site at some point. Um, but yeah, just do that, do your research. And if uh, you find something interesting on my site and you think I could be of assistance, by all means, drop me an email. Uh, yeah. I personally, yeah. personally reply to all emails. Uh, right. And uh, yeah, and if you have some legal questions, then yes, go and get Jonathan. He knows what he's talking about with respect to everything from uh, letters of intent to heads of terms to uh, SPAs, your share and yeah. purchase. No, fantastic. Yeah, sort of similar, sim I guess similar approach to Clinton. Um, hope you come across us online. Um, if, if anyone's not connected yet on LinkedIn, please feel free to get in, uh, send an invite there and um, and uh, we, we can connect. and participate in conversations around this subject further to the extent they arise online but um yeah i hope, hope you people can um, stay in touch and also come across our, our website and yeah we, we're always happy to help and as clinton says you know even if it's just uh answering you know a question or pointing someone in the right direction or putting them in touch with someone else um we're always happy to do that and we'll always um, pick up on emails etc um so yeah thank you everyone for for participating and um or, or listening in anyway and um yeah hope to be in touch um with some of you in due course yeah thank you everyone great. okay maybe we'll do this again okay Jonathan. yeah thanks a lot clinton that was great and uh, 